Good afternoon. I'm Phoebe Connolly, Deputy Director of Video at The Washington Post, which is a charter sponsor of the National Book Festival. I'd like to start by thanking the co-chairman of the festival, David Rubenstein, and the other generous sponsors who've made this event possible. It is my great pleasure today to introduce Charlie Jane Anders. She is the author of Choir Boy and All the Birds in the Sky, which won the Nebula, Locus, and Crawford Awards. She was a founding editor of io9 and co-hosts the podcast Our Opinions Are Correct with Annalee Newitz. Her most recent novel is The City in the Middle of the Night, which NPR called an intimate portrait of people as much as it is a piece of culturally aware social sci-fi. <clears throat> Anders has also penned a few pieces for the Washington Post's opinion section, including the provocatively titled Kamala Harris is Wrong About Science Fiction. <laughs> please welcome me, please join me in welcoming Anders to the stage. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me here. This is such a wonderful event, and I feel so incredibly honored to be a part of it. And I'm so incredibly grateful that so many of you came out on a Saturday afternoon when there's so much else going on just in this building to come see me. I, I'm so grateful. I really appreciate it. So um, I almost flunked out of first grade, and second grade, and third grade, and also fourth grade. I was the worst student at Southeast Elementary School. I was basically, the teachers hated me. And I remember sitting there in first grade, staring at a blank sheet of paper while all the other kids were doing their ABCs and kind of, you know, and I just couldn't do it. I couldn't write the letters. I couldn't do basic math. When I tried to write, you know, a letter of the alphabet, I would just end up with this like unfeasible cloud of stuff. I would end up with like a glyph that meant nothing. And this was a huge problem and you know I really came close to just slipping through the cracks and like being kind of just lost in the system forever. But then the luckiest thing ever happened to me. Um, which is that I got identified as having a severe learning disability and I was sent to work with this brand new teacher that had just started to work at the school. She was a special education teacher named Lynn Pennington. Um, who was, she was brand new, she was full of excitement and ideas, and she took me under her wing and really worked with me and helped me to master like the basic schoolwork that I had to master in order to get through, you know, first, second, third, and fourth grade. She did everything. She helped, got me to, you know, read and write. She got me to do basic math. She actually took me to the nearby university where my parents were teaching and took me to a specialist in math education who looked at me and kind of studied me and basically identified the problem I was having with my pattern in doing math, and I still can't really do math. She actually fought for me to have a calculator in fourth grade math, and that teacher wanted to kill her. Like, that teacher was super, didn't want to kill her, but that teacher was super, super mad about that. Um, and, you know, she took me to the local children's hospital and got me identified as having a sensory integration disorder, um, you know, so that, I could understand why I basically had no coordination whatsoever and she like taught me how to throw a frisbee and how to stand and how to hold it and everything. She did everything. But part of what was amazing about Ms. Pennington was the way that she helped me to get past my deficiencies as a, an elementary school student um, and to start, you know, actually learning. And that was that she appealed to my love of creativity. And, you know, part of what I did when I was sitting there trying to make letters on the page and trying to like do basic schoolwork and, and failing to do basic school girl, I was, I was daydreaming. I was a kid who daydreamed all the time. I just wandered around the schoolyard on my own, like with my imaginary friends and my imaginary adventures and yeah, my imaginary spaceships. And, um, you know, and that was how I got through it. And she basically helped me to channel that into something that would let me do the schoolwork. So for example, when I was still trying to learn how to write letters on the page, she really worked it the classic way, or she actually had her own way of working it, which was that instead of making me write the letter A a hundred times, she would have me write it perfectly once and then look at it and understand why that was different from the squiggles I'd been making. But also she had, she made a deal with me, which was if you can learn to do this, if you can learn to write the letters and make words appear in the proper order and with grammar and everything, then you can write a school play and we'll put it on, we'll perform it. And, it'll, and we did, I wrote a play and she, she told me, I talked to her recently about this, 
And she told me that um, as I got more excited about writing this play and the idea of writing a piece of a story that would actually get to be performed, um, my handwriting got better and better and more legible because I was into it, I was excited. It wasn't just something that I was having to do for school. And so we did this play called The Bad Cad, which was about a kid who is really bad, who is you know, a troublemaker, who goes around pranking the principal and like leaving you know, buckets that fall on the principal's head and things for him to slip on. And, you know, and we got it performed. We did, there was only one performance of The Bad Cad and you missed it, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know? And later on, you know, a couple of years later, she was like, she got me to make a fake newspaper and she actually drove me 45 minutes to Hartford, Connecticut to go visit the offices of the Hartford Current, which was our local big newspaper. And I got to see the printing press and all the stuff. And then I made a fake newspaper and this was my reward for learning to do schoolwork. So basically she turned my sort of daydreaming into something that could help with schoolwork. And she turned me into a lifelong storyteller. She basically gave me a love of writing and creating and telling stories that I've never lost. And she pretty much made me the person I am. And I'm still friends with her. I had dinner with her a few years ago. I talk to her on the phone sometimes. And you know, I'm, I can't possibly express how gra grateful I am to her for doing that. And you know, in my fiction, the figure of the kind of misfit child, the child who's kind of you know alienated or lost or kind of stuck in a world that makes sense to everybody else but doesn't really make sense to the, this person is a major thing in my fiction. And I feel like it's something that you see in All the Birds in the Sky, which was my attempt to kind of do a, a skewed kind of coming of age story about these two kids who are kind of struggling to be themselves in a world that's kind of trying to smush their, them down into fitting in with everybody else and they don't fit in and they don't, they're smart but they don't understand what everybody else is talking about most of the time and what everybody else cares about. Um, and you know, and then they grow up and you get to see how growing up as like a weird misfit kid affects you as an adult and how you find your people but it's also not what you hoped it would be. And then my most recent novel, The City in the Middle of the Night, is very much about that kind of experience of being kind of a weird, misfit, kind of in-between person who nobody quite understands. My main character is Sophie, who is painfully shy and incredibly like introverted and, and kind of awkward, who you know just wants to um, find a place that she belongs and just wants to find friends. And then she finally does find a friend named Bianca, and it doesn't entirely work out. Uh, but it's all, that book is also kind of a, a take on the coming of age story where part of coming age is, of age is losing all of your illusions and all of your kind of, you know, happy dreams about how the world works and also just all of your kind of the ideas that you were given as a kid and realizing that the world is not what you thought it was. And Sophie has to journey into literal darkness. She goes into the dark side of her world and learns to communicate with these creatures that live there in the dark. and. Um, learns to understand them and a big theme of the book because it takes place on a planet where um, there's no sunrise and no sunset and there's just permanent darkness over here and permanent blazing sunlight over there and you know there's a day side and a night side to her planet um, it's about kind of being caught between two extremes but also it's about dealing with your childhood and dealing with trauma and dealing with your past because she lives in a place where the passage of time is really kind of oblique and you can't really see time passing because the sun never goes up and, and never comes down. Um, and so it's, it's, it was a chance to think about memory and how we process things that have happened to us. Um, and then she meets these creatures, the Gellet, who you know, communicate through telepathic you know, touch telepathy, basically, if they touch you, you can see their memories and their experiences. And so that was another way to think about communicating in a different way and also having memories that you can share with other people and how that changes your relationship to your past. So anyway, back to like my learning disability experience. I, um, you know, I, my learning disability didn't go away after elementary school. When I was in junior high school or middle school, um, I was basically dual exceptional. Um, I was identified as being a kid who had, was both gifted and learning disabled, which is like, basically you're just like weird in two very different ways. And like you go to two different special ed programs, but like it's just, it's, you're kind of a weird kid in general, like nobody really understands you. And um, you know, it's kind of like the worst of both worlds because you're a smart kid, but you're bad at schoolwork. And so it's like, people can't crib your homework from you because you're, 
sucky at your homework, but also you're really nerdy and talk about like, you know, super obscure, weird, nerdy shit that nobody else understands. Sorry, I probably shouldn't be uh, cussing in here. But anyway, um, and so I, w I was in middle school and, you know, I was getting bullied a lot. There were kids who didn't understand my weird vibe. I had like a frenemy who was like, secretly kind of scheming, well, not actually, not so secretly scheming to destroy me all the time. There were kids who were like, there was a lot of like junior high school politics that I kind of like talk about a lot in All the Birds of the Sky actually, that thing of like, you're friends this week and then next week you're deadly enemies and then the week after that, maybe you're allies but you're still secretly enemies or I don't know, it was like, it was like a soap opera. It was like a really terrible, terrible soap opera that just never ended. And the thing that really got me through junior high school, I didn't have anybody like Ms. Pennington in, in junior high school. I didn't have a teacher, a special ed teacher who was really making that strong connection with me but what I did have was these stories that I was obsessed with. Like I wrote an essay about this a while ago, Star Blazers. Who here has ever heard of Star Blazers? Okay, a few of you. Star Blazers was this American version of this anime from the 1970s uh, called Space Battleship Yamato. And basically it's about this group of people who have to save the planet Earth from the evil Gamelon Empire which is trying to destroy the Earth using deadly radiation. And in order to save the Earth, they have to travel across the galaxy in an old World War II battleship that they dug up from the bottom of the ocean and turned into a spaceship. I mean, it makes total sense, right? And they, so they fly around in this old World War II ship and they're having adventures and they're constantly almost being destroyed. The ship gets like submerged in acid, it gets blown up, it gets like smashed, there's like, and you know, and they're just constantly almost being destroyed. And I would just run home from school every day, partly to escape the bullies who were waiting for me after school, but partly to go home and watch Space Battleship Yamato and see how they get out of the latest terrible situation they were in. And you know, I was obsessed with Doctor Who, I was obsessed with Star Trek and Star Wars and all that stuff. You know, I was writing like really bad Doctor Who fan fiction in my little school notebooks instead of doing my homework. Um, and back then, I thought that uh, the word obscene meant intruding onto the scene, which actually makes a lot of sense. It's like, if you think about the Latin roots. So, um, so my Doctor Who fan fiction back then was full of like things like, are you surprised to see me? He said, obscenely. <laughs> People were just constantly being obscene in my Doctor Who stories. It was great. There was like, you know, and I feel like, I really just learned the power of escapism, especially in junior high, especially with being bullied and being a kid who was both too smart and too educationally challenged for my peers. I, I really learned the value of escapism and stories and like, you know, stories about people who survive stuff and stories about people who get through terrible situations. And I feel like that is like every hero of every story I've ever written is that person who is, you know, misunderstood but surviving and getting through stuff and you know and I, I got through it I grew up more or less I think I don't know and um, and I knew I wanted to be a writer I knew I, ever since Ms. Pennington had me writing those plays and ever since I was like writing those like fanfic stories in my school notebooks I knew this is what I wanted to do I wanted to tell stories I wanted to create things like Star Blazers things that had things like all the stories that had saved me back in junior high school, I wanted to start create stuff like that and like maybe help to save other people or at least help to keep people entertained during like all the weirdness and awfulness of growing up and being a person and everything. And so, you know, I set out to be a writer. It took a long, long, long time to break in. I was writing tons and tons and tons of short stories. I tried to write a short story a week for a while and I just was writing tons of short stories and most of them were either never published or published in really small magazines. And it just, you know, I kept going. I, I didn't let anything stop me. And um, I just made up the weirdest, strangest stuff that I could come up with. And over time, I just sort of started to try to think about what are, what are these stories meaning to me and what am I actually doing in these stories. And I got into the habit of something that I still do now, which is that I will take a blank notebook or a blank Word document and just sit there and write down like, a bunch of questions to myself that I try to answer like, why am I doing this? What's the point of this story? Who are these people? What do they represent to me? What do these characters want in the story? 
and what do they, you know, and what do they, what do I want them to be doing? What do I want the story to be about? And what do they seem to be trying to do? And just try to think about what I'm doing in the story. And I know that people always say that the author can't really understand what their own story is about. But, you know, I, I actually disagree with those people. I'm not that drunk when I'm writing fiction. I'm kind of drunk, but I'm not like that drunk. I'm like, I'm still kind of on the edge of tipsy, I feel like, when I'm writing most of my fiction. And so I do have intent and I do have ideas. And I feel like that's a thing that I've really, that's helped me to kind of grow as an author over the last several years. And, you know, there was a time when, there has been times when I've been writing more kind of literary fiction rather than genre fiction. Like I wrote, uh, I wrote a thing that was in McSweeney's online once. I've written for a bunch of literary magazines here and there. My first novel, Choir Boy, was kind of literary fiction. Um, but I've always come back to genre fiction because of that formative experience of watching Star Blazers and dreaming about Doctor Who and being a weird little kid with a learning disability walking around the schoolyard dreaming about my imaginary friends and their rocket ships and stuff. I always just get pulled back into that because I feel like genre fiction is this amazingly powerful tool for, you know, thinking about the world we're in without all of the stuff that kind of all the stuff that's in the way of us seeing our world clearly. Like it's so, we're so close to the time we're living in right now that it's hard to see anything around us with, with clarity and getting further away and telling stories about other times and other places is often the best way to really see our time and our place with clarity and to understand what we're dealing with. And you can kind of tell thought experiments and you can kind of explore ideas of like, what if this happened? What if this happened? What if you know the world was very different? What if we lived on a planet where there was like a permanent day side and a permanent night side? And what would it be like to have, you know, be able to walk from like eternal darkness to eternal blazing sunlight? Oh, I'm big. Okay, I didn't even look over there before. And you know, and stuff like that. I feel like that's a really powerful tool. And so every time I would be writing literary fiction, I would kind of get dragged back into doing genre fiction. And like, for example, I had this one short story that I was writing several years ago that was about a couple who are in a long distance relationship and one of them is studying to be a lawyer and one of them is studying to be a doctor and um, neither of them has time for each other. They, they, they just don't have time for their relationship. They're like too busy trying to achieve their career goals and get through these incredibly demanding professional programs. And they're like, if only we could just take five years off and then meet each other again and start over then. And then they're like, and I was writing it as like a literary story. I was just like, okay, this is a realistic story about a relationship and this challenge that they're dealing with. And there's like, but what if one of them goes into suspended animation and then they can meet up in five years and no time has passed for that person. And then the other one does that so they can each have five years of their studies without having to have any distractions and then they can meet up again and only five years have passed for each of them. And I was like, okay, I have to write that now. And so this story that I thought was like a literary kind of genre story, a uh, literary kind of like, you know, realistic kind of relationship story kind of morphed into a genre story just because that was where it went in my head. And that was the most interesting way to kind of move the story forward, I thought. And, you know, and I had these stories that I was writing that were kind of about queer people in San Francisco dealing with like sexuality and identity and politics and, you know, the, the queer scene and gentrification and displacement. And over time, they, they were in the present day, but over time they just kind of drifted forward until, you know, it was the near future and then it was like the medium future and San Francisco was being flooded. And finally I ended up with one story that takes place when most of San Francisco is underwater and, you know, in our post climate change future that we're all looking forward to. And uh, that was just kind of something that came out of how that story was, uh, you know, took shape. And I feel like I, the, every time I have a chance to do stuff besides genre fiction, I really enjoy it, but genre fiction is my heart. And science fiction and fantasy are my heart. And that's because that kind of escapism and that kind of wonder and that kind of feeling of surviving the unimaginable and finding a chosen family and finding people who understand you and, you know, finding where you belong and discovering other ways to live and other ways to exist in the world. That, you know, that really spoke to me when I was struggling with my learning disability and when I was growing up and feeling like nobody understood me and feeling just trapped in this, you know, weird situation. And I feel like it's just, it's, 
it's only gotten more powerful for me and I think for the world since I started doing that. Um, so I'm really proud to be a genre fiction. I feel like it saved me and, you know, along with Ms. Pennington, my, my elementary school special ed teacher, it really saved me and put me on a path. And I'm so happy to be able to share that with all of you today. And thank you so much for coming. Oh. <clears throat> oh. So I could read a tiny bit from The City in the Middle of the Night, or we could just go straight to questions, which you do rather, because I heard John Scalzi did a little reading. I don't know. <laughs> reading? OK. I'm just going to read to you. Some of you might have heard this, because I did this same passage at, at, when I was here back in February, but it's short. Anyway, I'll just read a tiny bit from my new novel, The City in the Middle of the Night. Back in grammar school, they taught us all about crocodiles and what to do if you ever meet one. Don't try to run because you're on their territory and they can ensnare you in one of their long tentacles before you take your first stride. Plus, they can clear vast distances with their powerful hind legs, each one the size of an adult human. And their strong forelegs can climb any surface and dig through almost any barrier. You might be able to hide because we don't know how they sense their prey, since they can't rely on vision or hearing in this pitch dark wind that they live in, they may use scent or maybe they can detect motion somehow. Nobody's ever actually hidden from a crocodile, but you might be the first. The only real viable strategy though is to attack. Crocodiles do have a few weaknesses that a human can exploit. They have soft spots on their underbelly where the carapace doesn't extend all the way around. I know where all their major organs are because I watched Frank the Butcher carve one up for a fancy banquet after a few hunters had gotten lucky, returning from the night in one piece and with fresh game. But their main weakness the easiest one to reach is the exact center of the pincer that's right in front of me right now, sticking out of the creature's head. The impenetrable shell contains two knife-sharp claws, but at their midpoint is a forest of a hundred wriggling tongues, each one about the size of your little finger. If you manage to strike at the pincer's heart and hit those slimy appendages dead on, then you might kill it in one stroke. That pincer is so close, I can feel its edges scrape against my throat. It could slice my head off before I could even react. I try to summon all of my courage, brace my feet on the slippery ground to deliver one great blow to the warm spot at the pincer's fulcrum. I can do this. I'm strong enough. I raise both fists. Then I stop because I feel warm breath coming from beneath the pincer where the creature's mouth is. And that part of me that always stands back and pulls everything apart instead of just blurting out words all the time is asking, why is a crocodile's mouth so far away from all of those tongues anyway? She can't possibly be using them to taste anything or to make any sounds. Why are they right at the center of this armored scissor, vulnerable yet shielded? I lower my fists. Instead, I push my unprotected face forward, almost losing my balance in the dark. The pincer is all around my head and neck now, but it doesn't close and kill me. Instead, this crocodile lets me press forward and push my frost-burnt nose into the moist heat of her slimy warm grubs. They brush against my face and my head floods with urgent smells and disorienting sounds, a beautiful ugliness, too much to handle, like I'm out of my head drunk with no up, no down, nothing but a whirl of sensory overload. I almost keel over, but somehow I stay upright until I'm somewhere else. I'm way out in the middle of the night now, surrounded by huge sheets of ice on all sides. A mountain of ice and snow sidles past along the horizon. We're thousands of kilometers further out than any human has gone in 25 generations since we lost all of our scout ships and our all-terrain vehicles. Somehow, 
I can see in the night now, except I realize I'm not seeing at all. I'm using alien senses and my mind is turning them into sight and sound. I tear through the landscape so fast the wind can't keep up. A sudden storm could rip me apart, the tundra could swallow me whole, but I don't even care. My back legs push against the ground and the ice surrenders, while my smaller front legs rip into the slick surface, propelling me even faster and keeping my balance. I'm not running. This is something much, much better. I've never felt this much power in my body, and so many sensations flood into the ends of my two great tentacles as they taste the wind around me. I want to laugh, and then I turn and see that four other crocodiles are running alongside me, grasping some spiky devices in their tentacles and guiding a sled full of some kind of precious metal. I feel a surge of pride, safety, happiness, that they're with me and we're going home. And then we reach it, a huge structure in the shape of a rose with all of its petals spread, a circle surrounded by elaborate crisscrossing arch shapes. Only the very top pokes above the surface and the rest extends far below the ice, but still its beauty almost stops my heart. A glimmering city, many times larger than my hometown that no human eyes have ever seen. Cool. Thank you. So, we got any questions, or we could do a sing-along, or I don't know. Huh? There's mics, I don't know. Hi. Hi, I, I just had a question. I followed your work on IO9 previously, and I thought it was great. I was wondering, um, as somebody who writes not only science fiction, but about science fiction engineer, there was a recent there was the recent renaming of the Campbell Re Award, and the Campbell Award, and I was wondering. Um, um, and there's been some recent debates about representation within the engineer. Why do you think the engineer is just now having those debates about representation? The the what? The, the science fiction engineer. The, okay. the, yeah, the, it's having the debates about representation, uh. and, um, and 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 diversity just now, as opposed to having ha not happened in the past. I mean, I think that I kind of reject the premise of your question a little bit. I think the, that science fiction and fantasy have always had these debates about representation, and there have always been people who were on the outside who were trying to become part of this genre, and the genre has always been better when it has been more inclusive. And, you know, I feel like there have always been women and people of color and LGBTQIA plus people and disabled people and others writing speculative fiction and getting published a lot of the time. It's just that, you know, there has been a lot more resistance to um, people being included in actually the mainstream of the genre. And I think that things like the internet and social media and as with a lot of other social justice debates, these things have come to the forefront just because there are new platforms for having these conversations. But it's always been an issue and I feel like we've always been talking about it. Like I'm, I've been having these conversations for as long as I can remember and we've all been trying and pushing and you know finding ways or trying to find ways to to be more inclusive in speculative fiction and it's always been obvious that the stories are better the genre is better the worlds are better the 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 our imaginations are better if we include more voices and more perspectives than if we just center one voice and one perspective that is you know very limited and i think that um you know, we've seen it in the last like five, 10 years that genre fiction is having one of the best eras it's ever had. I've heard the phrase golden age tossed around largely because we're finally letting people in, but it's, this conversation has been happening forever and I feel like it's, it's way, way, way overdue that we're seeing more recognition of, of different voices in the genre. Thank you so much and thanks for reading IO9. Hi. Hi, I'm Jennifer. Um, thank you so much for your presentation, for your vulnerability, and for oh. sharing your story. It moved me on so many different levels. Well, I want so to thank glad. you thank for you. that. Um, so I'm a voracious reader. I'm probably never going to be a writer. So I would love if you could give us a window into a day in the life of 
writing one of your novels? Like, what would we see? What would we hear? What would we <laughs> feel? Just kind it would of be like so terrible. talk us through it a little bit because I'd love to kind of get a sense of, you know, what it's like to actually put an idea down on paper. Yeah, I mean, it's so funny because I had like a really good routine back when I was writing, when I was working on io9 and that was like, I had to really be disciplined because I was working on this blog for like, you know, eight or nine or 10 or 11 hours a day and then also writing fiction. Um, and so I would work on the blog and, you know, get up early, work on the blog until like late afternoon and then take a long walk to a cafe and then sit in the cafe and work on fiction and the taking a long walk was a big part of clearing my head. And now that I'm kind of just, you know, kind of doing it for myself and not actually working for anybody else most of the time, um, it's still kind of the same routine to a large extent. The taking a long walk is a huge part of it. I, I, I live in San Francisco, which is an amazing city to walk around in. We have Golden Gate Park, where there's like bison that I can go talk to about like problems I'm having with my story, and I do that a lot. Um, I don't know, I talk to myself a lot in general when I'm walking around, it's, it's terrible. I should get a Bluetooth headset so people think I'm on the phone with someone. But, um, so yeah, I mean, I just, I, I take a lot of long walks. I will, you know, I'll kind of do urban hiking and then I'll find a cafe where I, hopefully I don't know anybody and just kind of sit in the corner with my headphones and just type until it's time to go get food or something. And that's kind of a lot of it. I work, at, I'm trying to work on my fiction more at home as well, but I finally, that, that thing of like, you know, the walking just kind of helps me to get in the headspace, I feel like, and that's, so that's a big part of it, and, um, and lots of coffee, and occasionally lots of beer as well, I gotta say. Um, but yeah, I think that that's the main thing. You're welcome. Oh. Thanks. Hi. Hi, thanks very much for the discussion. I recently finished The City in the Middle of the Night. Oh, thank you. And I hadn't read a lot of your earlier work, so it was sort of my first introduction to your stories. Uh, my question was about how distant human cultural and um, social mores were transferred into this far distant society in a planet and a, uh, and a ecosystem very unlike our own. One of the characters references having a bat mitzvah, and there's some other traces of old earth history and culture that have trickled down into the far future, and I was curious how you chose to present that. Yeah, thank you so much. I spent so much time, so in the city in the middle of the night, I spent so much time working on this. In the city in the middle of the night, it's, you know, the year 3209, I think. It's like long, and it's like the 33rd century. And people have colonized this other planet where, like I said, there's a permanent day side and a permanent night side. And the night side is occupied by these creatures that I just read to you a little bit about who have the little tendrils that can communicate telepathically. So I spent a lot of time thinking about like what would human society be like in the 33rd century, like 1,200 years from now, basically. And I had that, to, to kind of get that, I had to think about like, what were we like 1,200 years ago? What were we like in like the, nine, the 900s or whatever, or the 800s, I don't know. Anyway, 800s, I guess. Um, what were we like then? And how much would they recognize of our world? And how much would we recognize of their world? And you know, it was a lot of different things that I wanted to kind of get in there and try to get right, because I feel like the failure mode of like, you know, humans living in the future is that everything is just kind of sterile and that culture has been, you know, either boiled down to just a few references, like everybody still reads Shakespeare or whatever, or everybody still, you know, listens to like this one piece of music or I don't know. I feel like it, it can get a little bit, you know, silly. And, um, and often there's just an attempt to kind of smooth over all of the stuff that makes people really interesting, which is our different cultures and our different you know, expectations and our different kind of backgrounds. And so I tried to come up with a future history where those things still existed and there were still religions. There's still, in my future, in the city in the middle of the night, we have characters who are identify as Muslim. We have a, one Jewish character, as you mentioned. Um, but ethnicity is completely different. And I thought that that was important because, you know, by and large, the ethnic groups of like 1200 years ago are not like nobody identifies as an Angle now. Nobody identifies as like a Frank. Um, nobody, had to, you know, there's a lot of ethnic groups from like 
1,200 years ago that aren't really talked about anymore because they've been subsumed or they've been changed or whatever. And so I came up with this really complicated, probably too complicated future where Earth has had some disasters and people are just living in these, these seven city-states that are protected from the outside world. And they were cities that were not famous cities today for the most part, like Zagreb is one of them, and like Nagpur in what's now India, and like Merida in what's now Africa, and then Khartoum in, in what's now Sudan. Um, I hope I just got that right. Anyway, um, and these were like the superpowers of the 23rd, 24th century, and they were the ones who sent people to this other planet to live on, and so people's ethnicity is kind of based on which one of these cities your ancestors came from on Earth, and nobody thinks of it in terms of like, I'm from the United States, or I'm from like this country. They think of it as these cities. And that let me really play around with ethnicity and identity in a really different way. Um, that's probably a really long answer, but I thought about this a lot because I wanted, I feel like the failure mode of this sort of thing is to be like, ethnicity doesn't exist anymore in the future, or ethnicity is exactly the same as it is in the 21st century, and I feel like those are both wrong. And so I thought about it a lot. So, Thank thanks. thanks for that question, I appreciate it. Hi, so um, I don't know if you've talked about this already in your, uh, in your talk, I stumbled in a little bit late. Um, but I'm in the middle of reading All the Birds in the Sky right now, and I got interested in reading it because <coughs> of a Twitter thread that I was on where we were describing that book as hopeful apocalyptic fiction. <laughs> and so that's really interesting to me, so I wonder if you haven't already talked about it, if you could talk about creating ideas and plotting ideas that incorporate hope, particularly in genres where sometimes it's darker and edgier and you don't get that kind of hope. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, I thought a lot about this and like I was really worried because people were, before All the Birds in the Sky came out, people were describing it as an apocalyptic story. And that was the era of like, it was coming after The Road and Station Eleven and a bunch of other things where it's like, it's the apocalypse, it's grim, it's dark, everybody is being really evil and like, you know, everybody has stubble. I don't know, um, <laughs> whatever. It was like, you know, and that was, and I didn't want people to think my story was like that because my story actually is very hopeful and very kind of, it's hopefully inspiring and it's about people who actually are there for each other and do their best and hopefully like save the world a little bit. And I wanted, so I kind of went around telling people it's a Buffy apocalypse. It's not like a, it's not like a walking dead apocalypse. It's a Buffy apocalypse. We're stopping the end of the world. We're not just, you know, wringing our hands about the end of the world. And I still, and since then, I've really gotten more obsessed with this idea that, you know, the apocalypse doesn't let us off the hook. Like, I feel like this idea that, like, the world is, like, a post-apocalyptic story in which we're already, everything's over and we're screwed and it's, it's too late to do anything. You know, there's something really cozy and comfy about that. It's like a warm, fuzzy pair of slippers to think that, you know, it's too late, we can't do anything, we're screwed, it's over. It's just, you can just relax. You can be like, okay, fine. I can just sit here and have like my mug of hot cocoa and like, you know, and my fuzzy bathrobe and not have to get out of bed because it's already too late. Versus it's not too late. We can do something. We can stop this. We can fix this if we work together, if we get past all of our, you know, our bull excrement. Um, I see a small child. Um, <laughs> You know, we can actually do something about this. I feel like that's harder and it requires more of us, but it's also, it's, it's really cool and it's really like inspiring. And I feel like there's been a lot of talk recently about having stories of fighting back and fixing problems and actually rolling up your sleeves metaphorically and like, you know, doing something and actually working together. And, and, and I feel like that's where I'd like to go. And that's what the city in the middle of the night is definitely that as well. It's about preventing the end of everything and trying to solve problems, not just like wallowing. And I had this one story where it starts with the end of the world, but then there's a, a genie in a bottle. So we have like an opportunity to do something about it. Um, I feel like that's, I like that kind of approach to the apocalypse. I don't really like the kind of like, oh, and now we're doomed approach. Thank you for asking that answering it. Yeah. Oh. Hi. Hi. I 
had no idea who you are, and yet I was meant to be in this room because I'm a past president of the Gifted and Talented Learning Disabled Network. Oh, wow. Oh, my and God. <laughs> Woohoo! Dual, dual exceptional. All of those kids are traumatized. So I'm wondering if there is a short story that these non-readers could read of yours because they might find inspiration that, you know, you can grow up and find your way. I mean, I wrote an essay for BuzzFeed about Ms. Pennington and about being learning disabled and how she turned me into a writer. You can just, if you search for BuzzFeed and Charlie Jane Anders and learning disability, I think you'll find it online. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm gonna name drop, I can't help it, I'm sorry. Um, I, that story I just mentioned where the apocalypse happens and then there's a genie in a bottle and you know, it's like you, you find a genie in a bottle after every the world has been destroyed. Um, I did a, last year, I guess, uh, LeVar Burton, that's the name drop, had me um, appear live on his uh, podcast where he reads stories, and he read the story and then we talked about it. So you can go listen to that. And we actually talked a lot about Ms. Pennington and about me being learning dis disabled and how she helped me get past that. So if you want to hear LeVar Burton reading a story by me and then also hear me talking about being learning disabled and how I got through it um, with LeVar Burton being super nice to me. <laughs> um, you know, there's that. It's, it's on his website somewhere. I hope that helps. Thank you. And thanks for all the work you do. I really, you are amazing. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, just a real obvious question. When you're writing your stories and you're constructing these plots and worlds and characters, what kinds of uh, things do you take inspiration from to help you along this process? You know, I mean, it, it can come from anywhere. Like, ideas are, like, I come up with story ideas all the time, and oftentimes I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a cool idea. And then some of them just kind of burrow into your head, which is what happened with All the Birds in the Sky, this idea of, like, what if there was a witch and a mad scientist and they were, like, best friends in junior high school and then they met again as adults? And that was, like, that was the thing that just kind of took head of my brain, took hold of my brain. But I think that, you know, I mean, I read science. Like, I feel like The City in the Middle of the Night definitely came out of reading about science because we were discovering all of these real-life planets that were like the one in my novel. And we were learning more about these planets while I was working on the book. So sometimes real-life science gives me inspiration. Um, sometimes I will, you know, just think about a trope that, you know, is like a trope that I'm obsessed with. And I'm like, but what if this happened? And then I have to go write that. Like, for example, if, what if there was the end of the world and then someone found a genie in a bottle? It's, but, you know, I've, I'm, the, I'm the billionth person to say this, but ideas are the easy part. The hard part is what does the idea mean to you and how are you the person to write this, kind of? Because I have lots and lots of ideas that I'm like, oh, that would be really cool. If someone else wrote that, I would go read that right away. <laughs> I'm not going to write that because I, you know, I, I feel like coming up with the idea was like the end of what I could do with this, you know? So I feel like the ideas that kind of, have, that kind of stick to you, that kind of get inside your head and you just keep thinking, about, oh, what about this? What about this? That's the stuff where you have to, and often it comes down to just, you know, things that help, you know, that are helping me to get through whatever I'm dealing with, like especially the last few years, I've gravitated towards story ideas that just give me hope or energy or make me want to keep going, kind of. Cool. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I just want to say I love your books. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Oh my and God, I had a question you. about City in the Middle of the Night. Um, so sometimes you read a book and they really like lay everything out for you, and then other times with City in the Middle of the Night, I felt like the world building was a lot more like breadcrumbs here and there. So can you talk more about kind of your thought process behind, okay, what information am I going to share with the reader and when, and make sure you kind of keep people you know, thinking and engaged with it? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, City in the Middle of the Night, like there's so much to that world. There's so much going on. It's humans living on another planet. There's like all the stuff about the planet and how there's like a permanent day side and a permanent night side. There's two different human cities that have radically different, you know, societies. There's like these alien creatures who we, I read a little bit of them just now. And like, it's, there's a lot going on. And I feel like, you know, the thing that actually I had to really work at in that book was like giving the reader enough information without kind of overloading you. And like one of the things that I kept doing in the revision process was just adding in more stuff. And I feel like to me as a reader, I like it when I find out about the world in a dynamic way. 
like, you know, the per my, my favorite example is, I think it was Tobias Buckel who has this thing about like, when I describe, I try to describe a room in the middle of a fight scene. Because people are fighting, they're knocking things over, they're bunking into the walls, they're like, you know, you can describe their surroundings in the pro process of describing them fighting in their surroundings. And that's more interesting than stopping for like a paragraph and being like, the walls were yellow. There was a vase, which will be knocked over in the fight scene three pages, three pages from now or whatever, you know? And so I try to do that. Like in the city in the middle of the night, the early drafts, I was like, well, you know, it, it actually, the opening was much faster. And I was like, okay, you know, there's this part where Sophie is being dragged away by the police officers over this thing where she's taken the blame for her friend stealing some money. It's a whole complicated thing. And she's being dragged away by these police officers. And I'm like, this is a perfect chance to describe a lot of stuff because it's a really intense scene. She is being dragged along and seeing all these buildings and all these things and all these people. And as she's seeing it, she's having emotional reactions to it. And she's in this really intense moment. So everything is going to land in a way that it wouldn't if you just described it all. And I tried to find opportunities like that. But people were like, I need more. I need more. So I just kept adding more passages where it was like, She's walking around and noticing things, and you know, having re having kind of having a relationship with the city that she grew up in. I think, but it's tough. It's really hard. I don't personally, as a reader, like to have the story grind to a halt so that I can have a long description of stuff. I like to see it organically, and I, that's what I try to do as a writer too. But it's really hard because, especially when it's someplace that's so different, you have to just find lots of sneaky ways to work in the information in a way that's kind of emotional rather than just like, here is some information for you, you know? But it's tricky, it's really hard. And that was probably the hardest one ever. And I, I'm writing YA now and I'm always in awe of like YA, YA authors who will do scene setting in like a sentence. They'll be like, there was a room with a court, there was a building with a courtyard and some columns, now we're getting into the scene. And it's like, how did you do that? It's amazing. Like I'm really working at trying to do that. Anyway, thank you so much. So this is just in response to the person who previously asked about the article in BuzzFeed. And I just thought I'd let everybody know that it's, it's footnote 32 in your Wikipedia entry is a direct link to the article. Oh, well, OK. <laughs> hey, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. I, I think you're wearing a has books on it. Yep. Yay. <laughs> I love it. So my question is related to that, is, is basically what books have influenced you, what authors, and what you're reading now? Yay. OK, this is the last question, by the way. Um, yeah, there's so many influences on me. Uh, one that I keep coming back to over and over again is Doris Lessing, who wrote The Golden Notebook, and she wrote the Martha Quest novels, and she wrote a book that is an amazing called The Good Terrorist. And I feel like I get a lot of credit for being original because people read my stuff and they haven't read Doris Lessing. And they don't realize how much I'm just ripping her off. Uh, Ursula K. Le Guin, for sure, Octavia Butler. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut, Douglas Adams, Nalo Hopkinson. I could go on and on. There's so many, but I feel like for me, Doris Lessing is a major, major touchstone. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Oh my God, thank you.